I feel resigned that there's this sort of tide coming that's rolling over everything and it's, it's irreversible. We humans are gradually encroaching on more and more habitat and that's just slowly disappearing. You just can't withhold this tide. Hey, stomp them on. Come on up. Do you think we're gonna see some salmon fish in there? Before my daughter was oh, two, she could tell the difference between deer, caribou, elk, and moose. Uh, with you know, just by just by seeing some of these things. So, I think those interactions, whether direct or indirect, uh, with the you know the natural world around us, is important to you know form a well mindset of of stewardship. My name is Steve Clegg. I uh, grew up here in Chilliwack, up in a small little rural community called Ryder Lake. Uh, as kids, we'd just you know, get up in the morning and our parents would kick us out of the house and you'd have all day just to, to play around and get lost and, and see what you could find. And we had a pond on the property, so we were continuously catching frogs and toads and salamanders and things. We used to have that family of toads, remember we used to, on our old garage, when you um, would open up the garage door, yeah. they wiggled away every night, they wiggle in there and you open it in the morning and three of them, what, five of them be lined up there. Sleeping. <laughs> when you get looking at the, the adult western toads, uh, you can get right down in front of them and, and they look like Arnold Schwarzenegger toads. And their, their arms are just massive, so that you get in front of these things and they're, they're very interesting things to look at. When it's really sunny and uh, about say 11 or 12, um, you can just stand on the deck and go, hey guys, and all of a sudden the ground just starts moving. My name is Debbie Patoli and I'm a children's counsellor in the CUSP. Right now we have toadlets all over the property so I can't get in and plant anything because there's just too many toadlets and I, I'd be worried that I'm, I'm killing them. It makes life a little challenging and I'm, I'm human, it's annoying. Um, when I get home from work and I'm tired, I've got to get out, check the road for my driveway for toadlets and and go, walk all the way back down, get in, then slowly, you know, head over, you know, looking for movement and, and then getting out and it's like looking for toads and telling the dog, look for toads. And um, yeah, so it, it definitely, you know, it does impact your life, but they didn't ask us to move here. We chose to move here. So we're kind of have to be responsible for that. These animals just got so much heart. It's like they come across a barrier and they will, I mean, we've watched them try to get up rocks and they fall off and land on their backs and, and they flip back over and they go at it again. They're so fragile when you watch them and you see like their skinny little legs and, you know, their little bodies and just the stuff that they're able to do is just such, it's so amazing. It's not an animal that I would have thought, you know, I would have a connection to or feel responsible for or actually even love. My name is Jacob DeLise. I'm an independent wildlife biologist. So this is a pit tag. This is the smallest one they make. And we inject them. It has no batteries in it. So it lasts forever. And so what we're trying to do is get an idea of the population size. And if there is a decline over time, we'd like to be able to measure that. And a recent workup uh, this year uh, suggests that there is a population decline since we started this uh, five years ago. So right now we're at Summit Lake between New Denver and the Cusp and it happens to be right beside 
Highway 6, and it happens to be uh, one of the most significant breeding sites for western toads in BC that we know of. The global population is declining. Mainly it's a range contraction issue. Well, this is the second time we've caught this male here. On breeding site three, we call him Stumpy. He's an amazing survivor. He's, he's lost his right leg at the ankle level, essentially. So, and they use their rear legs for swimming. So he's a pretty poor swimmer, and I imagine walking through the forest as well. So Stumpy here uh, may have been injured on the highway. We see a, we see a lot of uh, really horrific injuries and sometimes apparently they survive. Oh, it's touching to see him just with such a zest for life and giving it a go. You know, he's not letting it stop him. So the highway mortality occurs three times a year, essentially. So in the spring, the adults come down and they have to cross the highway to get to the breeding site. When they're finished breeding, females lay their eggs. They live in the forest, so they have to cross the highway again. So that's the second time. And then the young ones, when the eggs hatch and the tadpoles transform into little toadlets, we call them. And this is the part that most people see is the masses of toadlets crossing the highway. So that would be the third migration. I didn't, for the life of me, expect to see the millions, actual millions of these little creatures running up our driveway and across our pasture. There was so many at one time there, they were just in motion. So just like a carpet moving. With the western toads in Ryder Lake, there's roads that surround their breeding wetland uh, 360 degrees around it. So when they migrate three times a year, they have to cross those roads. And when they do, they get squished three times a year. The worst part for me is having people drive by because you can you can hear the toads popping. You can hear so many and it's really hard to listen to that. Most people that stop are totally into helping the toads and people that don't stop are the people that just don't care. So this is a female. And judging by how kind of hefty she is, I think she's already laid her eggs this year. She's probably leaving the lake. That's exactly what we don't want to see. The last 24 hours, we've done some highway surveys, nighttime and daytime. We found we had 50 adult toad detections on the highway just during our surveys. Keep in mind, these are underestimates. Half of those were dead adults. So this is a fairly typical 24-hour period in the spring along Highway 6. 25 dead toads. Of those, nine were adult females filled with eggs traveling towards the lake. These females can lay up to 20,000 eggs. So if you do some really simple, crude math, that's 180,000 eggs that are not gonna be laid in this lake right now. Well, as far as the traffic rate goes here, we do know that it's increasing every year. So it's one thing that we can count on in the equation is that road mortality will probably increase over time. So perhaps local residents that have lived up here for decades and have experienced this migration every year have just thought, oh well, you know, that's just a mortality rate and they come back every year and what's the problem? What they don't notice 
is that over time, there's less and less and less of them. And the real tragedy is this, that generational degradation of the environment is something that we don't really notice. Uh, all of us use a baseline of our awareness of the natural environment as to what it was like when we were kids. Well, every generation, there's less biodiversity, there's less natural spaces, there's less habitat areas for animals, there's less varieties of, of, of animals that we engage with on a regular basis. If we wait another 20 years, there won't be any toads here, and it won't be a problem anymore. A lot of people, when they think of amphibians, they tend to think of a frog sitting on a lily pad in a wetland, and they think that the wetland is the only part of the environment that an amphibian needs, but all of our species here on the coast don't follow that sort of regime. They breed in the wetland, but then they live in the terrestrial environment and they can move hundreds of meters to a kilometer or more away from the wetland. So protecting just the perimeter of a wetland isn't necessarily enough to meet all their habitat requirements. I was just hiking through the forest and I came up across some flagging and whatnot. And so I've done some silviculture work and I'm like, this is a cut block laid out. So I came home and I phoned and the first thing we were told was um, it was students practicing. And then I was like, well, there's actual roads laid out and, and, and you know, with permanent sort of markers and whatnot. And then, and then we're told, well, yeah, we're, we're going to do some, some logging in there. And I said, but what about the toads? And the reply was, what toads? All this devastation we're seeing here is just the start of the logging here. Right away we ask, what has happened to the habitat? And what's going to happen to that habitat once they start logging in there? This is only the second time I've been up here. Uh, I find it really hard. Yeah, it's just really hard. I'm really trashed just to know that there's toadlets in there. Look at the size of the trees. This, this is what we're losing toad habitat for this province, for the world, is for these little trees. It's crazy. It's really crazy. Rider Lake residents uh, got together and shared uh, a common voice that, that you know, something can be done a little bit differently to help these little toads and other amphibians get across the road safely. And that word got directed to the Fraser Valley Conservancy. They were hosting an event to, to bring some attention to the issue there and that kind of made it click in my mind a little bit that, hey, this is something that's, that's right next door. I only have to <laughs> walk down the road and, and go lend a hand. And I think that fit quite well. We didn't really know what to do or how to help these animals that were uh, breeding on one side of a busy highway and living on the other side. We researched, we learned, and there are ways, of course, that can mitigate or, or, or help these migrations, and, but they're very expensive and we didn't have the funding or the resources. We started off uh, inviting volunteers to come up here on an annual basis when we saw that the migrations were taking place. And a lot of school kids uh, would come and fill their little plastic pails and carry them across the road and let them go on the other side. It was really wonderful watching that happen and it was a terrific education opportunity. But again, it didn't really solve any problems. There's no sustainable uh, way that you can continue moving animals that way. I'm Sigourney and I'm 11 years old. I live in Chilliwack. And it's sad to, that toads will die when you run them over with your car. So I like to save them. I love how nice and round their eyes are and I love their little bumps on their back, how they're rough bumps and how they cling to you with their little hands. So what we've tried to do is direct the traffic away from these, these hotspots where, where they're migrating. 
know, that quickly morphed into where we worked uh, with the city of Chilliwack to, to implement these road closures, which would block off at certain times of, of the migration portions of the road where they're crossing in, in, the, in the densest numbers and uh, just let them cross as naturally as possible. That was pretty hard to deal with. That was very difficult for Steve to have to mollify some of these people, talk to them, deal with other volunteers who were going to get right out of control, mad at these people bashing barricades or taking down signs or purposely driving right over the toads. Yeah, it was tough. I guess I was in an extra odd position as it might be easy for an outsider to come in and say, you know, this is the goal and, and this is what we're doing and this is, this is what we want you to do. But when it's your neighbor that comes up and is asking you these types of things, then it makes it a little bit more personal and you know you have to go home at the end of the day and live beside them. So we put a sign, one of these, the other one, in the center because there's toadlets everywhere here. Um, and obviously somebody took it out and threw it into the bushes because if they hit it, they would have just knocked it flat, but it's like thrown into the bushes. Oh yeah, like you don't think we're gonna see a sign of white? Jerks. It's still good. Okay, we need this one pounded in. I'll go look for that one. Would you want to put it here or leave it there? Okay, well, let's think like an asshole. So most people won't go through here yeah. because it's overgrown. Yeah. And uh, so I think right there. So I Unless I find that one. Well, then we take that one. Right and look, here. they tore it. Do we, we don't have the stapler have the gun? Okay, but we have it at, in my car, so I'll come back and staple it. And I went out Friday morning, and oh my God. They're, they're here. They're going. Like, they're going. We headed out, uh, I think it was 9.30ish, and just started bucketing. It, it was our TV box, because we're like, we need a big piece of cardboard, so, uh, well, we kind of pack rat a little bit. I don't, why do we keep boxes? And, and we think this is, well, it's obviously an, an underestimation, because there was no way to track all the people that were bucketing this three kilometers of the lake, but at least 100,000 toadlets got across the highway. We wanted to find out where the toads were breeding, where they were crossing the highway, how many were getting killed on the highway and where, and possibly construct some uh, underpass structures to get them safely across or under the highway. In 2006, the first underpass was built. And then in the summer of 2014, Ministry of Transport put in another underpass, especially designed for the Western Toads. So we were really happy about that. The idea with the underpasses is to get some animals under the, the highway. It won't be 100% fixed. There will always be um, toads dying on the highway, even if you have some underpasses. The idea is to hopefully, hopefully have enough animals traveling under the highway that the population can sustain itself. Did a lot of cold, rainy and wet nighttime monitoring in, you know, in February and March, uh, sometimes snowy, sometimes rainy and foggy and, and uh, the, with the intent to GPS uh, thousands of occurrences of, of the adults as they are migrating uh, to the wetlands to breed and then away from the wetlands. 
gathering those thousands of GPS points of where they're crossing the roads allowed the Fraser Valley Conservancy to amass that data and look at it spatially and see where what we call the key migratory corridors were. Like, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? The toads are on the road. And now, you know, the fencing is starting to work. We actually have the culvert installed. Finally, after so many years, they're gonna go into the tunnel, use the tunnel, off the road, not dying. I'm excited. And as you can see, there's actually toads going through it right now. So it's already working. Go toads, go. We're not gonna ever be able to stop all of them because they migrate in all directions and we only have, you know, so many crossing structures in place. If you look at the actual where the tunnel is here, there's just not that many dead bodies compared to other places on the road where they've been on the road. So to me, that's really exciting because we know that more of them are making it across alive this year than did last year. So I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. BC government has spent close to $750,000 to move these animals under the highway and now the habitat's gonna be logged. What was all the money and effort and all this really good stuff? What, what was it all for? Not only is it unjust to the animal, but that's unjust to me as a taxpayer. So you just used my money to put these animals under the road so I feel good. And now you're gonna destroy the habitat and you're gonna make me sit here as a resident and witness that. It feels like an absolute betrayal. From that point, it was engaging other biologists, First Nations, local people, different environmental societies, basically just trying to bring a whole lot of people together to say, hey, this is a very tiny area and we really need to save it. These toads have nobody. Like they're, they are literally at, at our hands. So we can either help them or we can turn our backs and, and leave them to their demise. Amphibians are kind of an indicator species or a sentinel species that when, when things go badly for amphibians, it's other species are not that far behind, but they're kind of the early warning signal. The real battle is up here. It's, it's how all of us think, think differently. Because the toads aren't doing anything different. It's us and how we think. And it starts with the species defenders thinking about those toads. And that changes how the people think and eventually ends up changing how the society thinks. The only thing that will solve the toes problem is for our culture to uh, shift its values so that we make room in our world for all these other species. British Columbia is bigger than Germany and France combined. So there's a lot of territory here. We can exist with these beautiful wild creatures. If we can't pull this off, who can? like it takes a community to raise a child. Well, it takes an entire community to also stand for the toads. There's a growing number of people behind saving this area. We're just gonna keep going, because that's all we can do. You know, it's funny, people ask, oh, what's your passion in life? And you know, I'm, I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know really what my passion is, but it turns out it was toads. If we do something now, we can bring all these back and make a really big impact. We care about life. We care about people. We care about salmon, birds. Why shouldn't we care about a toad? Toads, they grow on you. And, they're, and, and the things that they do just to get to that habitat, you have to respect that. Something so small 
that plays such a big part in the ecology of the area and in my life now and in a lot of people's lives. We can learn from that. And maybe that's what I've learned, to culture that drive in myself and move it forward. But all you have to do is take that first step. Don't think about what you're gonna do, what you're gonna have to do. One phone call, one email. So you don't have to be an environmentalist. You just have to be someone that cares. A big aim of mine right now is just to, to show people that it's okay to care. I think there's a lot of people waiting in the wings that would like to do conservation-minded things. And if I can be just that one little bit of encouragement to do so, I think I might be doing an all right, all right job. <laughs>